Hello, welcome. Uh, this is uh, Charles Denham, chairman of TMIT, and it's a, a real privilege to welcome uh, our webinar and a terrific set of uh, speakers today. Uh, unfortunately, I'm at an airport leading this webinar, so I will mute very rapidly. But uh, this webinar is the uh, one focused on uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, questions and answers for the partnership for patients, telling the boardroom story. Uh, and again, uh, I will be pretty brief. We'll move to the slide showing uh, those of you that uh, that are online to make sure that you uh, increase your, your sound and audio. Uh, on your uh, screens, and if you have a difficulty, uh, then log on with us if you have the uh, the slides, and we'll help uh, with a backup number. Uh, if you go to our uh, uh, website uh, slide, which is slide four, you'll see where you'll be able to download our web webinar and information. And again, sorry for the background uh, uh, sound uh, uh, here at the airport. Uh, the next slide really just addresses where the information can be downloaded uh, and uh, at the site, and within two or three business days, we'll have a transcript and an auto recording. Uh, next slide, if you wish to uh, uh, log on to Twitter or Facebook to follow uh, us, we also have those uh, addresses on the slide. Uh, the next slide is our mission, TMIT's mission to save lives, save money, build value in the communities that we serve. And uh, I will, if it's too noisy, I'll have uh, Frank uh, Guillotto make a uh, uh, the introductions to the speakers. We'll just see how, how we do. Uh, Ed Carl, you'll let me know. Uh, the next slide has our speakers, and uh, we always begin our, our uh, webinars with uh, uh, a grounding statement uh, by a patient. We're honored to have Alicia Cole, a patient advocate and champion. We'll have uh, uh, Bill Munier and a Andy uh, Hackbarth, both as uh, uh, speakers for us today, who will uh, address the uh, the Q and A sessions for uh, for our uh, uh, the questions regarding the partnership. And I know the noise is uh, uh, great, so I'm going to mute my phone and immediately go to Alicia Cole and ask uh, Alicia to give us a, a 30 second statement to really just ground us in what we're about to do. Thank you, Dr. Denham. I'm really uh, privileged to be here today, and I appreciate being invited to participate. Um, I think it, this is just a great opportunity for collaborating with open hearts and open minds, and I, I, I'm looking forward to learning more about the Partnership for Patients, and I know that all of the people listening and participating in the webinar will be blessed by the information that we share because this is going to be a great collaborative information. I invite them to to write in their answer, their uh, questions. I think this will really help and it will show the value of how the patient experience and the boardroom can come together in the quality improvement process to help get us to where we need to go with, with patient care. And I thank you for being here. God bless you all. Thank you, Alicia. And we'll move quickly to uh, uh, Bill Mune and uh, Andy Hockbarth and ask them to uh, uh, recite the questions. This is a set of questions regarding the measures uh, addressing the partnership for patients. And we'll ask them to uh, address the question, read the question, and then uh, give us the answer to those questions. And immediately following, we have uh, the quality leader, the chairman of quality for the Cleveland uh, Clinic and uh, the Cleveland Clinic Network of Hospitals, uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Mike Henderson, and we'll ask him to uh, respond to those and kind of react to those. And Dr. Henderson, it is about contributed to the question, so I think he will ask him to kind of underscore with his reaction uh, what he is hearing. And then at the very end, after our other speakers uh, have spoken, we'll have an open Q&A where we'll come back with uh, questions and we'll remind all of you on the web uh, site or the web uh, webinar that are logged on to the webinar to enter questions that you might have in the in the question and uh, answer window in the bottom right hand uh, corner of your screen. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, have Bill Mooney and uh, Andy Hackbarth uh, uh, go ahead and address the questions and the answers. And again, we'll be audio, audio recording this and prepare a transcript within two business days. Uh, Bill uh, is a terrific leader uh, with the Agency for Healthcare Quality and Research. We worked with him for a long time, and he is really a a great champion for measurement. Andy Hackbarth is a special uh, advisor in this area to CMS, and uh, I'm not going to belabor our introductions with the noise in the background. Bill and Andy, go ahead. Uh, this is Bill Munier. Thank you very much, uh, Chuck. Uh, we're delighted to be here this afternoon and appreciate having uh, the chance to 
uh, <clears throat> talk about questions that we've been getting about uh, the, the measurement strategy, both nationally and locally, for the Partnership for Patients. This is a quality improvement uh, initiative, and the hallmark of quality improvement is to measure where you are now and where you are in the future, so you'll, uh, you can document what problems you have and how you've improved them. Uh, so measurement is an important part of this campaign. Uh, and we're going to attempt to address the questions that we know we've been getting and then, as uh, Chuck mentioned, uh, respond to, to additional ones that may arise. So let me just uh, go through a, f a few of these and then I'll turn it over to Andy. I'll read the question and then uh, uh, supply an answer. So the first question is, what are the additional measurement and data submission requirements for hospitals that join the partnership? Uh, the, the answer to that, we, we have a two-pronged measurement strategy where we're accumulating information that will allow us to give national rates, and I'll address that in a moment. Uh, and then there are the local uh, measurement that goes on in the individual hospital level working with the hospital engagement networks. From the national standpoint, uh, there is no additional measurement burden. Uh, from the local standpoint, uh, each hospital engagement network has a measurement plan that the hospital would be asked to commit to in terms of sending data in, and the networks have committed to that in their contracts with CMS. Uh, so the plans will vary by, net, by network. Uh, obviously, it's not ideal to not have the same kind of measures everywhere, but we have to live with a system that we have for now. Uh, the department is investigating the feasibility of providing uh, a free and uniform uh, and very simple measurement system to assist those uh, hospital engagement networks or HENS that don't have a uniform way of collecting data that, that is based on the department's common formats that were developed under the auspices of ARC. Uh, and with the participation of uh, the major health agencies within the department, uh, the Department of Defense and the Veterans uh, Administration. Uh, so we'll get back to you with more information on that as time goes on. And that would be a way that, that hospitals could easily collect comparable information based on a lot of work going into defining adverse events and uh, harm. Uh, so the simple answer, uh, again, is that at a national level, there's no additional burden. At a local level, it's whatever the, the hospitals work out with their, uh, with their, um, uh, their hen. The second question is, how will the national adverse event rate be measured? How will we know how close we are to our national goal of a 40% reduction in preventable adverse events? A consistent estimate of the national rate of adverse events for inpatients uh, will be measured by using data that hospitals already are submitting to the federal government, as I indicated before. Uh, copies of medical records submitted to CMS as part of the, their inpatient quality reporting program will be used to generate rates for 21 different types of adverse events uh, using a system called the Medicare Patient Safety Monitoring System which is a software system developed jointly by ARC and CMS. And despite Medicare being in the name, uh, since 2009, this system has included all payer patients over age 18 in its review. Information submitted to the CDC National Healthcare Safety Network, about which you'll be hearing more shortly, will be used to generate the rate of surgical site infections. And data submitted to the states by the ARC Healthcare Cost and Utilization Project, or HCUP, uh, that data comes from the states to ARC, and it's already uh, generated uh, without, uh, again, additional burden. And that will be used to generate rates for six additional types of adverse events uh, using ARC's patient safety indicators. Our current estimate for 2010 is that there were about 137 of these measured adverse events per 100,000 mission, uh, and 90% of that total comes from the Medicare patient safety monitoring system measures. Uh, the estimate for 2010, the baseline year prior to the beginning of the Partnership for Patients start uh, in April 2011, will be updated based on some pending data and finalized in May of 2012. Question three is how will the national readmission rate be measured? How will we know how close we are to our national goal of a 20% reduction in readmission? Uh, again, we're using two existing federal systems to track 30-day, all-cause, all-condition, all-payer readmissions. CMS claims data will be used for Medicare and Medicaid, 
and our H cup data, which I just referred to, will be used for private insurance and the uninsured. Uh, with those four uh, cohorts covered by two federal systems, we can calculate an overall national rate um, uh, and track it throughout the three years of the campaign. Question four, <clears throat> what is the relationship between the local measures used by uh, HENS and the national harm and readmissions measures, are they the same measures? Well, is, the answer to that question is sort of self-explanatory at the moment in the fact that uh, because there isn't one system used nationally, uh, we calculated the national rate the best way we could based on existing systems with uh, having in mind that we did not want to impose any extra measurement burden on participating hospitals or HENS in order to generate those national figures. So we're using the systems that have the, the best scientific underpinning that we can get. With respect to the local measurement, as I mentioned before, uh, the plans will vary by network, uh, but we do hope uh, through ARC's common formats, which uh, are available on the web now at the ARC website, that common definitions for events are available that have been uh, put through a, a lengthy process at the department with the participation of all the agencies and should found, uh, provide a scientific foundation for defining these events uh, for anyone who uh, would like that assistance. And again, we will be investigating uh, the feasibility of a free system to collect information uh, using those definitions uh, in the near future. So I'm gonna, now having answered the first four questions, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Andy for the next couple. Thanks, Bill. Um, and thanks, Chuck, for uh, for hosting us again and giving us uh, this forum to, to talk about this important topic. We're uh, very pleased to be here. So I'm going to keep moving on. Uh, we're on question five now, which is, which specific measures should participating hospitals use to track readmissions and adverse events? Um, and, and with a few of these questions, you'll see that we're sort of getting at the same um, sort of core structure in a few different ways just to make sure that we're um, uh, answering answering all the different types of questions that hospitals have, but but this, you know, th the answer to this ties into everything that, that Bill's been saying. The specific measures that hospitals should be using um, are going to be the local measures uh, that that Bill referred to. These will be the measures that are uh, defined by the hospital engagement networks that hospitals uh, will be joining uh, as participants in the partnership for patients. Um, we will be publishing, um, for example, the methodology we're using to identify readmissions in the national data sets that Bill mentioned uh, in case uh, HENs and hospitals uh, would like to be consistent with, with that um, uh, methodology. Although, of course, the, the data sets will be different, but you, you know, things like how to handle um, breaks over the calendar year and, and um, transfers and, and those sorts of details on readmissions will be available. Um, uh, in terms of adverse events, uh, there are going to be specific measures um, at, uh, at the intervention level for, uh, you know, from, from hen to hen, from one hospital engagement network to another. Uh, they might not be the same measures. Um, there might be uh, slight differences in uh, identification criteria, although we expect that in many cases um, there'll be uniformity across HENs. Um, for example, with some of the uh, infection uh, adverse events that are targeted by the Partnership for Patients. Uh, we're expecting that many of the uh, definitions and measures will follow uh, some of the CDC definitions that are there are in use in a lot of states, for example. You know, the, the I'll, I'll mention that the overarching consideration with this dual strategy for measurement where we have the, the national measurement happening um, without any need for um, additional hospital data submission, but we have the, the local measurement strategy defined uh, on an HEN by HEN basis, is for those those HENs to be able to uh, identify the, the right combination of uh, ease of use, so using measures that are perhaps already in use or that hospitals within their constituency are, are primed and, and prepared to, to collect, and uh, uniformity uh, both within those HENs and uh, across the country from one HEN to another. And, and I'll also mention that we are currently underway 
uh, with, a, with a reconciliation process with, with the HENs to see if there are low-hanging fruit for alignment um, in measures uh, across HENs. So even though, uh, strictly speaking, there isn't a requirement for the HENs to uh, all use the same consistent measures for readmissions or adverse events, um, and will be essentially deferring to their expertise on their local context when choosing those measures, uh, we will be, there is an organizing um, structure there to try and identify cases where uh, consistent measures can be used um, in a and at least, a, if not nationally, a large number of these HENs. And I'll talk a little bit more about how we'll be using that aggregated data later. Uh, next question, number six, do participating hospitals need to track all cause harm? And if so, what methodology or measures should be used? The framing of the Partnership for Patients is it's, it's targeting all types of harm. It's, it's mentioning and, and identifying a uh, core set of adverse events that it's targeting. Um, and all hospitals participating will need, through their HENs, to be working on those core measures, uh, excuse me, those core adverse events. But the intent is really to, um, to ultimately uh, attack all-cause harm. And we believe that the goals of the initiative can't be achieved unless um, hospitals move beyond that core set of adverse events and, and start tackling all-cause harm. Uh, that said, it's not a requirement for hospitals to track all-cause harm, but there are some um, options available to hospitals, and we hope that they pursue um, measuring all-cause harm either through existing methods, and, and Bill mentioned one in the common formats that we're going to be um, we're exploring making available to, to hospitals if they want to try and use that. There are other methods available as well. Um, and, and I think probably the national content developer, which is uh, our sort of the, the structure in place in the, in the initiative to disseminate and collect uh, useful content, including guidance on measurement and uh, uh, innovative measures that, um, for example, uh, one hospital um, or another might be, might be uh, using, will be a great source for, for that information in the future. So um, hospitals do not need to track all-cause harm, but we're really encouraging them to do that and um, either using existing measures or to try to explore innovative new ways of, uh, of tracking all-cause harm. Next slide, please. Uh, question seven is, uh, when and how frequently will national harm and readmission rates be updated? And actually, I'm going to turn back to Bill for this one. Okay, thank you, Andy. Uh, the, the simple answer to that is that we, we haven't determined how frequently we can. Obviously, it's desirable to update them as quickly as possible. It's our thinking right now that quarterly is probably about as frequently as we're able to do it just because of uh, mechanical issues of the way data come in for the different systems, the different three systems that we're using. Uh, MPSMS available uh, data is presently available about nine to 10 months after end, the end of a quarter. And I believe Medicare data is available uh, at about the same time. So we think that we may be able to uh, use sort of tracer indicators that are pretty good uh, for both rates, both uh, uh, hack rates and readmission rates, perhaps somewhere around uh, nine to 10 months lagging after the time frame, and update those on about a quarterly basis. So that's our current thinking now. Um, Andy, I I'll pass it back to you for question eight. Thanks, Bill. Uh, so next question, when will HENs release their local measures? So we described uh, the strategy where the, the HENs will be um, coming up with the local measurement strategy. Uh, so when can hospitals expect that strategy to be made clear to them? Some HENs have already done this uh, for hospitals in their constituency. First of all, I should say that if you're a hospital and you have joined the Partnership for Patients, you, you should have heard from your HENs already and should be uh, at least aware of which uh, network you're, you're going to be joining. If you haven't done that, um, please, uh, please uh, submit a question uh, and, and, and let us know to the, um, to the Partnership for Patients uh, email address, and uh, I'll be posting that. Um, I think I can get that after after the the, uh, the webinar. Um, so, so, to this question specifically, some HENs already have released their local measures. Uh, others will be doing so shortly. As I said, we are in 
talks with uh, with the hens to try and coordinate some of the the local measures, if possible, across HENs. Um, so I think that process will be will be finishing uh, relatively soon, and, and hospitals should be getting uh, the the sort of final uh, local measurement plans from their their HENs soon. Next question. What should hospitals be doing right now to prepare for measurement and data collection within their HEN? Um, really, the best thing that hospitals can do is to uh, to establish communication with their HEN, understand where their HEN is in terms of the measurement strategy. In in some cases, the the strategy is well defined, and the HEN will have specific guidance for the hospital. Uh, and others, the uh, there there might be still some work uh, to be done. But in any case, getting in touch with your HEN uh, is, is the right approach here. They'll have the details for um, what measures are, are going to be in play. If those aren't finalized, they'll at least have some idea of, of what measures they're, they're looking at. Next question, question 10. How will participating hospitals submit local measure data to their HEN contractors? So just as the local measures are uh, defined to a large extent by the HENs, they'll be uh, potentially different data submission structures in use by the HENs. In some cases, uh, there's an existing data submission platform that the HEN will be supporting through which hospitals within their network can submit these local measures. In other cases, the HEN is, is developing a new system. But in any case, just as in the last question, um, the, 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 the HEN is the appropriate um, contact for getting information uh, on how those data submission uh, systems uh, w will work. Um, so in brief, there will be potentially different systems for each HEN and hospitals in that network uh, will be receiving information from their HEN on how to submit the, the measure data. Next question, question 11. Um, if local measures are intended to help hospitals manage their own improvement work, why are hospitals asked to submit those data to their HEN contractor? Uh, so this is a this is a good question that 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 we get a bit. You know, as as we take pains to to say, the uh, you know the primary objective of the the local measures is to get the is to help the hospital support their improvement efforts. In other words. We believe you can't have improvement without a robust measurement strategy, um, and the, the teams working on the specific interventions, uh, addressing the different types of adverse events, trying to improve care transitions and reduce readmissions, they need these local measures to, um, to, to know when what they're doing is working and when it's not working. Uh, however, there's another purpose, um, also important, which is uh, that the HENs and, and the, the federal coordinating office, which is overseeing the, um, the initiative, also need feedback on how uh, progress is going in more real time um, than can be offered by the, the national measure measures that, that Bill described earlier. So an important function of that data submission um, is to, at the local level is to provide the HENs with guidance on how their constituent hospitals are doing. Those data will then be rolled up into an aggregate HEN level uh, report uh, and submitted periodically to the, the federal coordinating office who will see um, at the HEN level how progress is going for a select set of uh, leading indicators of, of measures. So not necessarily all the measures that are being collected by the HEN, but, but the ones that really signal um, whether things are proceeding on a pace that will get us to our goal or, or, or not. Um, based on that feedback, uh, both the HENs and the Federal Coordinating Office can reshuffle uh, resources, can um, point out great successes when they happen, uh, but also uh, target challenges as, as they're arising, you know, learning about those um, uh, relatively quickly as opposed to learning that things are slow in a particular hen um, only, uh, you know, a year after the fact. So there's, there's an important um, other purpose there, um, which is to, to help us and help hens manage the initiative. And also, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, a large investment of taxpayer money, and uh, there are certain statutory requirements that, um, that, that we have in uh, being able to provide updates on, on the progress of, of the initiative. And so that's, that's uh, an important part of this as well. The last question, question 12, what will happen to the measure data submitted by hospitals to the HEN? 
will the federal agencies associated with the PFP, for example, CMS, um, have access to individual hospital data? So I, I, I answered this a bit in the last question. The uh, the measure data that's submitted locally within a, in a, with, by hospital to their HEN will be rolled up to an aggregate level um, in some of those measures submitted to uh, the federal coordinating office. Um, however, there will be no individual hospital data reported in that way. Um, and, uh, you know, we've also received some questions and, and uh, are aware of some anxiety about the relationship of the data submitted through the Partnership for Patients and some of the upcoming um, statutes in the Affordable Care Act, which relate to um, uh, changes in reimbursement for hospitals, for example, for um, high-risk adjusted readmission rates or uh, high adverse event rates, both of which are targeted by the Partnership for Patients. Uh, none of the data submitted by hospitals to their HEN or to the um, or aggregated and, and passed along to the federal coordinating office for purposes of managing the project. None of those data uh, will be used uh, in any way for any of those reimbursement uh, programs. So this is essentially a safe place for hospitals to work in the same areas that will later in a few years um, be uh, the criteria for some of these reimbursement uh, projects. It's not necessarily the case that um, the the measures that are used by by hospitals will be will be different. It's, it's possible that an HEN, for example, will select to use the same, um, for example, readmission measure uh, that uh, is going to be used by uh, the ACA section uh, 3025, which is the readmission um, reimbursement program. Um, but the, the data that's submitted um, as part of this program um, will, will not be used. So, so um, in short, uh, the federal agencies associated with the PFP will not have access to individual hospital data, um, although we will be seeing a selection of aggregated data at the HEN level. Um, but none of those data will be used um, for any of the reimbursement programs coming out of CMS over the next few years. Uh, so that is the last question. I, we will have a recording of all these answers uh, at the link provided on the next slide. And, uh, and I'll turn it back to Dr. Denham now. Thanks. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Andy, and thank you, Bill. Uh, and I, I think the, the overarching kind of back text to so much of what you've shared with us is that uh, this is dynamic and that there's a huge recognition or a recognition of the huge challenge of uh, measurement burden that uh, is uh, uh, cognizant to everybody out in the field, so that uh, I'm really, I'm really appreciate, I really appreciate the fact that uh, uh, that the folks here in Washington, where I am today, uh, are really aware of that and doing their very best to make it as easy as possible, even though it's a, it's rather complex and takes time. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, have uh, uh, Dr. Arjun uh, uh, Suravasan. Uh, speak for just a few minutes uh, to give us an introduction, if you will, to the uh, an overview of the National Healthcare Safety Network, the, uh, the NHSN, because of uh, its importance. And then we'll go to Dr. Uh, uh, Michael Henderson from uh, the Cleveland Clinic. So the next uh, uh, set of slides are with Arjun. We're really honored to have him a participant and a team member on our Greenlight program, the collaborative that has been a collaborative on infections. And uh, Arjun, can you give us uh, uh, the the preview to our next webinar one month from today when we'll allow you to have a little bit greater time, but we thought this was so important that we give you a few minutes today. Th thanks so much, Chuck. Really appreciate the opportunity to have just a couple of seconds to spend with you today. Uh, many of you are probably already quite familiar with the National Healthcare Safety Network, but I'd like to mention it here very briefly because I think it addresses some of the questions that have been raised about uh, the, the issues of local, local measurement and the importance of local data for local action. Uh, as 
Bill mentioned, there's work towards a, a system to help with the monitoring of uh, some of the healthcare acquired conditions uh, that are targeted by the partnership. And fortunately for the healthcare associated infections, uh, that free system uh, already does exist in the National Healthcare Safety Network, which is a, a free web based monitoring system for the healthcare associated infections. It covers all of the healthcare associated infection events that are being targeted by the partnership. And it's currently being used by more than 5,000 healthcare facilities in the U.S. So I would imagine that uh, most, if not all, of the hospitals where you're working currently are already enrolled in NHSN. Uh, as you also are probably already aware, it's being used by uh, 29 different states or territories uh, and by the Center for Medicare Services for required monitoring of healthcare associated infections. Uh, primarily in acute care hospitals, but now expanding to long-term care, uh, inpatient rehabilitation facilities, and dialysis centers. And the NHSN website link is uh, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, as Bill mentioned, one of the important needs in all of these measurement systems is, of course, to have standard definitions. And NHSN has uh, developed and continues to develop and refine these definitions uh, that have been on ongoing uh, and in use for more than 30 years. And so it does uh, include those standard definitions. And of course, as, as Bill mentioned, we've worked very closely with ARC and for these HAI measures uh, to make the common formats measures and the NHSN measures uh, uh, cross crosstalk. Uh, and there are a number, other, a number of other important features of NHSN that I won't dwell on here uh, because they will be discussed in more detail uh, on the next call. But the one feature that I will mention which I think is, is relevant is the fact that the data can be uh, aggregated, it can be rolled up, and so this does serve, would serve both the needs of a facility to use its local data for local action, but also it can be used by a hospital engagement network to uh, roll up the data from a number of different hospitals. There's a lot of experience using NHSN for quality improvement initiatives. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of hospitals uh, use it on a daily basis for their own quality improvement initiatives. And it's also being used by larger uh, quality collaboratives uh, like the On the Cusp Stop BSI project uh, run by the folks up at Johns Hopkins, uh, as well as the quality improvement organizations for both the ninth and 10th uh, scopes of work. Uh, and I do believe that NHSN does provide a, a very good tool for meeting some of these local measurement needs, which are uh, critically important uh, in helping uh, the, all of you as you work on your uh, targets for the partnership for patients uh, for uh, reducing these healthcare-associated infections. Uh, there will be more to come on this later, so I'll turn it back over to, uh, to Chuck. Thank you, Arjun, and uh, we really appreciate all the great work you do at the at the CDC and uh, 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 as the Associate Director for the HAI Prevention Programs. It's such an important target that's going to continue to become a key issue as we go forward, so it's great that it has the overlap uh, that it does with, uh, with the program. I'd like to shift gears uh, quickly to have uh, Dr. Uh, Mike Henderson from the Cleveland Clinic uh, join us uh, to, to kind of react to what he has heard, and he is, was a contributor and has been a great contributor to the questions. Also, uh, he, uh, uh, Andy Hackbarth, Bill Mounier, myself, uh, Steve Swenson, and others at uh, CMS uh, will be involved in an uh, implementation article in a special issue of the Journal of Patient Safety that will complement a formal measures article that will just be authored by Andy, Bill, uh, and the CMS folks. And we're really appreciative that Mike is really weighing in to help us really have a practical perspective uh, on implementation and really the view of the chief quality officer as the chief quality officer of the Cleveland Clinic. And Mike is, uh, is a general surgeon, um, sub-specializing in hepatic uh, disease as well as uh, with uh, uh, transplantation and uh, is uh, uh, someone that continues to do Whipple procedures. So he's very active in very complex surgeries and uh, uh, as well as leading quality, which is a great balance. Mike, go ahead. Uh, thanks a lot, Chuck. And uh, again, I appreciate being on. I, I think many of you have probably listened to the uh, webinar last month, and then this follow-up I think is really important. Partnership for Patients is a great program, and I think the vision and the plan uh, is uh, how can we really uh, see harm reduce and transitions of care improve. Uh, the 
question for the front line and for the hospitals is how, how do we make this really fit in with everything else we have to do, all the reporting that we have to do, inpatient, outpatient, patient experience, physician reporting, etc. I, I think partnership for patients is doing the right thing. It's focusing on much of what hospitals are already doing and trying to bring some order to that. Uh, what you heard from Bill Munier and uh, Andy Heckbath are the important aspects of how this gets measured. Uh, that is the challenge, uh, and that's the people who are really facing the challenge in this, I believe, are the uh, hospital engagement networks. So I think it's up to the hospitals, uh, as Andy pointed out, to really engage with those and help shape their agendas. Uh, that is what's going to make this successful. Uh, I think the issues I think I see at the moment that the front line really need to become more comfortable with are uh, what this webinar is all about, the understanding of uh, what the program is going to do, uh, what's being measured, how is it being measured. Uh, that is what's going to drive change. Uh, Bill Mounier kind of spelled out that it's going to be a significant time lag, and that's always the problem before you know what's happening at the national level. By the time that data flows through, okay, hospitals don't have to do anything extra to get that. I think it's a good strategy, but that's not what's going to drive the performance improvement part of it. As Andy has pointed out, the hands have to drive that. And as all of you in the hospitals know, it is about timely data that's going to drive performance improvement. So I think it is how quickly uh, and how well can the hospital engagement network set up that data flow to help drive it. Certainly in our health system, that is our challenge. And uh, trying to work real-time data, or what we call short cycle data, really makes a difference. Do I know what happened this week rather than what happened last month or three months ago? And I think many hospitals have already figured out how to do that. You're the people who need to help your hands uh, really drive that on a broader scale. Uh, I kind of have a couple of questions I want, I want to throw back that I don't think we have covered fully yet. So get your pens out, uh, Andy and Bill, because I, I, I think it's important that we understand uh, a bit better how many hospitals you really think are going to be participating in the uh, hospital engagement networks. It, it seems to me that we're going to see, what, 20%, 30%, 50% of hospitals in the country. Uh, so we're relying on them to drive much of the change, whereas the country measurement clearly will be for every hospital in the country, because that's the data set you get. So I, I think a further comment about that. The second sort of issue, perhaps, that didn't come up in the questions yet is, is the big communication picture. You know, Partnership of Patients has got a website out there. I know how hard it is to keep those up to date. These webinars are important, but the whole communication of how the measurements are going to be made, what the expectations are, uh, certainly, I think most hospitals feel they live and die by how good their internal communications are. This is a program that is going to need a lot of publicity and uh, communication over this next couple of months as it really cranks up and gets going. And then so my so final comment is really around the some of the hand data flow. Uh, I think it is important that that sort of aggregated data is looked at, comes back in, uh, as well as the local, local data. So to me, you've got the really local data that will probably drive most of the PI, but uh, there needs to be that intermediate group, I believe, between that and the national data you're going to see probably a year later. So we know on a month, every few months, are we really making some progress? There's nothing worse than a project you're driving and you're saying, well, wait another three months, another six months before you know if we're really making progress in the bigger picture. So I think uh, some of the vision around what we're going to really try and do with some of the aggregated hand data, and what the timeliness of that might be as we try and drive it forward. Uh, there's no question in my mind, hospitals are ready to do this, reducing harm, 
right up there, number one, improving transitions of, of care, right up there, number 1A. These are, these are the top entities out there, and in that sense, really have chosen the right things. The front line really have to help make it happen, though. And I really think you guys have done a great job on this webinar and the last one of, of putting the issues on the table. So thanks very much for taking part in it, and I'll turn it back to you guys. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Mike. And you brought up three great issues. And after we have our formal speakers reacting, I'm going to come back to you and then have you just recapture them very, uh, just repeat them uh, quickly uh, regarding the numbers of involvement, the communication, and what we'll be doing with the data. Just recast them when we have our open Q&A session so we can uh, get a little bit of a, another couple of views from other folks. And I'll move on to uh, Ellen Bristwa. Uh, Ellen is giving us uh, a, a view from on the top, if you will, uh, of uh, community leaders that are at the boardroom uh, level, and it's a real honor to have somebody with a wonderfully distinguished uh, academic career as a nurse and as a nursing leader who also has been a, one of probably one of the longest standing trustees of, uh, of hospitals who's really seen it all and seen this transition. And so, Ellen, uh, we'd like just a, a few minutes of, of your reactions. We are going to invite Ellen and other board members in our next webinar next month because we're really going to focus on this board issue working with our board members and building boardroom teams. But Ellen, can you just share with us as someone who is a trustee at, in, the, in the Cleveland Clinic system who's responsible for um, not only a 200-bed hospital but also being on a quality committee of the overarching initiative of one of our great organizations that you and Mike serve, could you give us your perspective as a trustee of what's, what, uh, what's key and preview for us what we'll talk about in a little bit more detail uh, 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 next month? Well, I uh, am listening to all of this and thinking about uh, what uh, your um, average trustee would think listening to the complexity of this and, uh, and the significance to uh, patients of this. And I think it might be very uh, easy for trustees to, and very tempting to step aside and defer to all of the, and, and they are significant uh, experts uh, on the technical side, on the clinical side, but I think the big message here is that um, trustees' responsibility for quality of care has to be reaffirmed and, and their um, knowledge uh, strengthened about all of this if they are really going to uh, do their job in governance of these institutions. And um, I think uh, that they, um, boards can help uh, with the national work by interpreting uh, when the data uh, and results start to come out interpreting that uh, within their organizations and out to the community and certainly uh, with with patients and who are their neighbors and friends about the importance of this work. So I think that um, the uh, implication possibly uh, from listening to this is that the uh, trustees have to have a lot more education about this so that they are comfortable um, in listening to it and, and are not um, tempted to um, defer to others, but really take on their own responsibility for ensuring quality of care and supporting uh, the um, the PFP program. Uh, the other thing that I think is really important is to, that the trustees need to support all of the people in their organizations that are doing this work. Um, and by that I mean that uh, encourage them to stick with it, uh, to um, protect uh, resources within the organization that are allocated to doing uh, this measurement work and reporting work, uh, time spent going to these HEN meetings. Very important um, because otherwise the the work won't get done and people start to feel uh, overwhelmed or defeated that they aren't um, able to make a contribution to this enormous uh, effort to improve safety and quality in our country. Um, the other thing, I think, is to take a look at uh, board's agendas, uh, Chuck, that um, this needs to be at the top of agendas. Um, and we've made a big change within the Cleveland Clinic's entire uh, system that quality and safety and, or, and, and conversations about um, what we've talked about today uh, are leading agenda items and that there's sufficient time um, allocated in running the agenda of meetings uh, to, uh, to encourage trustees to um, uh, feel comfortable about this and also to send the message that this is a very, very important part of trustees' work. I don't know if you had any other... 
No, uh, Ellen, I think that's uh, terrific, and I would just say, uh, uh, Kyle, as you move to my slide, uh, and I'm going to keep my comments short because of uh, the noise in the background and giving uh, more airtime to others, but uh, what you're hearing from uh, from Ellen uh, Bristois is exactly what we'll address in our next webinar in February. Uh, we have committed to the Partnership for Patients and through our Greenlight program, of which uh, Dr. Henderson is a, is a leader along with those from Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, Vanderbilt, the Harvard-affiliated hospitals, and a number of frontline hospitals, including small hospitals represented by the likes of Steve Sosland, who you'll hear from shortly, uh, and others. And our next webinar next month, we will address this board issue, and Ellen brings up really key, key points, and we'll be announcing in more detail our board training and certification course for new board members existing board members uh, for uh, those that would like to become prepared to serve as a board member uh, and for those that are the quality committee chair of the board, be they clinically trained or non-clinical in background. Uh, sometimes it's more important to know the right questions than the answers. And so we're going to be uh, undertaking uh, a major initiative, and this has been built in also into the QIO contracts to make sure that board members and trustees are involved. So as we move to uh, my slides, uh, and Carl, I'll have you advance them uh, to me for me. Uh, the slide uh, with the title of the article, The No Outcome, No Income Tsunami, is here. Are, are you a surfer, swimmer, or sinker? Uh, we use the expression that surfers will make things happen, swimmers will be thrown in the drink and watch what happens, and sinkers will uh, be lost and wonder what happened. And uh, this article actually addresses this powerful force of the no outcome, no income tsunami that we are uh, that we are all facing. And again, I apologize for the noise. I'll keep the comments brief. The next slide addresses the NQF Safe Practices 2010 report. We are gearing up for the 2013 uh, uh, update of the practices, and we had uh, some conversations at NQF today. The next slide addresses Safe Practice 1, which is culture of safety, leadership structures and systems. And it is, in effect, a blueprint or a roadmap for boards. The next slide addresses the, just a couple of highlights of the responsibility of the governance boards in identification and mitigation of risks and hazards, not that they would identify them, that they would be thoroughly briefed and that there would be a standardized approach to do so. The governance boards that must be understand culture measurement and the performance improvement initiatives, such as the Partnership for Patients, which is the perfect example, which we will incorporate into the safe practices. And it's important to note that 90% of all of the partnership for patients is undergirded by the safe practice work we did with the NQF that cross-links with serious reportable events and the hospital-acquired conditions. The next slide addresses further description of what governance boards uh, need to uh, have and need to address and, in effect, a roadmap. The next slide really addresses a special issue of which there will be 10 articles that address the boardroom. We like to say the, the ground zero in the war on healthcare harm and waste is the boardroom, not the bedside. So you'll see there will be special issues of the Journal of Patient Safety, of which I'm the, the uh, editor in chief, uh, on high value performance imaging, a partnership for patients, which will likely be the first one, partnering with purchasers, suppliers, and high performance leadership, really focused on that boardroom with a global uh, special issue with the BMJ, and we'll have uh, we'll announce more of that as we go forward. So I'll close my remarks to move on to Frank Guillotto, uh, but what I would say is, is that uh, uh, our next series of webinars will be focused on the boardroom. You as a safety quality officer can actually begin the conversation and brief your boards, as Ellen described, and de detoxify the complexity as things evolve uh, for CEOs, COOs, and CFOs to understand the resource allocations and why this is important and why it should be at the top of the agenda and, and how board members can become equipped to actually be a real contributor uh, to these issues. So in our next webinar, we'll have representatives that are uh, folks that have been on the minority development track for, uh, for safety net hospitals, uh, the likes of Ellen with more detail there, uh, physician board members and trustees and how they've become equipped and, and how they can serve, pharmacy, uh, those with pharmacy backgrounds, but we'll really address the basics of what are the fundamentals that a board member or um, a chief operator, operating financial information or executive officer might need to know about these programs as we go forward. And we'll have a certification program and formal training program complemented by webinars, coaching, 
and online. I'm going to move now to Frank Gieto and introduce our Chief Technology Officer, the man behind the scenes at TMIT, a real driving force behind our Greenlight program, which we address, uh, where we address a lot of these issues. And I'd like to have Frank Gieto, who has a background as a uh, biomedical engineer. He's been with TMIT for 20 years and been involved in uh, our LeapFrog work, our impact calculator work. But I'd like to have him introduce to you uh, just a quick a couple of minutes on SpeakerLink. And SpeakerLink is a program that, that evolved out of the quality net meetings when Regina Holliday, who was a speaker, uh, along with patient advocates, were asked by me. I, I asked them, what could we provide to the marketplace to help the partnership for patients and for patient advocates to get into the boardroom and help share their stories and become part of uh, the quality infrastructure? And for the person, they voted highest on having a uh, speaker portal. And so, Frank, I'd like to have you kind of go through speaker link and give us a couple of examples before we, uh, before we move on. Thank you, Chuck. Um, indeed, uh, this has been an exciting project that we've undertaken here at uh, TMIT as part of, uh, kind of our gift to the community and really uh, looking at how we can build an environment, or in this case, we look at it as a website, but really it's a tool where organizations that are currently being asked to increasingly um, bring the patients and the patient's advocates into their environment, into their boardroom, and really being able to, to understand, you know, where, first of all, do we find these folks, and then second, what uh, will they bring uh, to the boardroom, and how do, how do we assure that the content and the topic is appropriate? So as Chuck mentioned, we, we had this uh, kind of a uh, insight from uh, two of probably the leading um, patient advocates in the space with Regina a Holiday and the e-patient Dave, who really, you know, we need to give them credit for that foresight who, and have given us a, a kind of a framework, if you would, within which we can operate. And SpeakerLink really addresses two customers. One, who is the uh, speaker that has a story to tell and is looking at a way to engage uh, organizations and share some of their knowledge beyond just a local network, but also um, the uh, seekers, which are the hospitals currently out there or groups that are looking at um, hearing stories, stories that may A, inspire us, but also give directions uh, to the organizations. So we've got a uh, essentially a, a view of, uh, of our website here. If you go to speaker link, gives you the option whether you're a speaker, whether we refer to as a seeker, which is a, an organization looking at uh, doing this, um, and uh, uh, selecting a speaker. So you would click, for example, find a speaker, which will give you a, a menu of options, and you can look at uh, a search function that will uh, be by topic, by speaker name, and we also have included uh, certain functions such as the fee range, the target audience, where they travel to. And uh, when you, you click that search, you'll get a result page that gives you an inventory of the patients that may be uh, relevant or advocates that may be relevant to the topic. And with that, we've got a uh, we've had this launch since September, uh, September. I'm sorry, December 15th, and uh, we've uh, got over 80 um, patient advocates that have signed up, and we're looking, obviously, of expanding that. So, uh, regionally and locally, we're we're sending out messages and trying to have folks uh, participate in this effort. But this gives you a little bit of a kind of a perspective on on the type of footprint that we're looking at aggregating, realizing that sometimes a local message is is very important. So if you're an organization looking at uh, out of Texas, you know, who and what can I find, uh, who would be the individuals that uh, might be relevant. Uh, the profile of the speakers are is provided so that you get some insights when you click down on one of the search results. Here we have one of uh, uh, the uh, uh, speakers, uh, ePatient Dave, uh, who, um, and they self-select in terms of content that they're going to be providing you. So in this case, uh, e-patient Dave uh, really has uh, an extensive background and does a lot of work with uh, social networking, but in this case, it's targeting culture, leadership, and trustees. And we have tabs that show whether or not they have a recommendations if they've spoken at other organizations. Again, realizing that this is a critical component when you're bringing someone from the outside into your organization, some biography uh, information and how to contact them. And really, in, in this case, the contact piece is, is very simple. You just submit your email 
or the organizational um, name that uh, that you represent, and you'll get their contact information, and you can subsequently uh, engage them and vet them. We're, at this case, just acting as a venue for this. Uh, we're going to be pursuing uh, educational programs to help these speakers expand some of their uh, skill set and make sure that when they do go into the boardroom, they're well prepared. And uh, part of this, uh, this is a part of our gift to the community. Um, in closing, um, we're keeping a, a close track on who and what is uh, traveling in terms of topic and interest so that as we uh, seek additional speakers, we're able to provide um, really a good uh, resource set. And then um, I'm going to highlight or feature a couple of speakers here just to, to tell you the type of talent that we already have. Uh, obviously, Chuck already spoken about Alicia, who um, has done some extensive work and was at the QIO Quality Net meeting. But, you know, she, um, she has uh, been involved in uh, sponsoring bills and, and really understands some of the key issues around HAIs and can articulate them in, in a very vivid and personal manner. Uh, Becky Martins is one of our long time, long-serving patient advocates, and she has been instrumental in her uh, local area in engaging uh, patients and getting them to participate in uh, their activities at their local uh, uh, organization. And finally, uh, Fred uh, Trotter, who is um, an expert in EHR, so you're getting a perspective from the technology standpoint with the patient uh, slash uh, patient advocate perspective, and he has been involved in, in many assessment of EHR systems, but can really provide the perspective to the board and to the leadership of what that means uh, to implement at the organizational level. So we're very excited. If you know of anyone, even if it's a personal friend, uh, please uh, give them uh, the link to speakerlink.org. Uh, you don't have to be a world-class speaker to be part of this. Again, Really, you'll get to choose as a speaker whether or not you want to, to, to participate in, a, in, a, in an organization. But uh, you're putting your name out there, and you know, our objective is to provide that, that network environment where, they can, where folks can share their stories, inspire others, and make a, an impact in quality and safety. Great. Thank, uh, thank you very, very much, Frank. Uh, and, and so before we have our Q&A, we've just asked uh, Steve Sosland uh, to, to offer the, uh, a balanced perspective to the Cleveland the leaders of the Cleveland Clinic that is one of our largest uh, uh, systems, uh, multi-hospital system, on the end of, other end of the continuum, but nonetheless uh, uh, talented, uh, an extremely talented uh, fellow. Steve Sosland comes to healthcare from other industries uh, and has been a, a a, a, a terrific executive uh, with a, a wonderful background academically, uh, and his bio will be on our, our, our website. However, he is the chief operating officer of a hospital, an 86-bed hospital operating at 50 beds, that has chosen to become one of our um, one of our research test bed uh, cities on the hill to really show what our small and rural hospitals can do with extremely talented and dedicated people. And I'd like to have Steve. Uh, who has uh, had a, a, a terrific background in industry, uh, provide the non-clinical chief operating officer's perspective from uh, our small and rural hospitals that are really, really challenged, and yet they really want to rise to the occasion and become the sea biscuit story, I think, of uh, healthcare uh, transformation. Uh, Steve, it's a real honor to have you just reflect a, a few of your thoughts before we go to Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Denham, and I just uh, want to give my appreciation for you and for the entire TMIT team for putting on and hosting these webinars that help all of us who participate. I especially want to thank Alicia Cole because it's your story that reminds us of why we all do what we do for those of us that are in healthcare. Uh, it, for those of us who have been students of uh, Dr. Denham and TMIT and have seen the Chasing Zero video, we know that all stories have heroes and victims and villains and crises, crises and resolution. So Dr. Denham asked me to tell our story, and I want to give you a sense of, of uh, our journey at Hill Country Memorial in Fredericksburg, Texas. Uh, we've been working on preparation for value-based purchasing. We've been focused on shifting from provider-centered and volume-driven market to a patient-centered and value-driven market. 
and have focused on quality and safety. So we were thrilled in April of last year when Secretary Sebelius announced the Partnership for Patients program. And uh, I would tell you that if you ask our team, uh, we, we would tell you that we don't have buy-in to the program. We are all in to the program and uh, fully committed. Uh, but yet uh, the story uh, that, that we have isn't necessarily one that uh, it has uh, been without its uh, unique challenges. And, I, and for those of the other uh, participants today that are from small and rural hospitals, I would tell you that uh, we, we hear often uh, a story that uh, is more like the slide that's up now. Uh, and, I'll, and for Ellen, I'll tell you that uh, last July we had – uh, the Texas Hospital Trustees Annual Conference in Dallas, and our trustees uh, attended and sent back a message in the middle of the conference that one of the keynote speakers had said that hospitals with less than 100 beds should no longer exist. Of course, that catches us a bit uh, by surprise. I would tell you that we also had uh, articles in July of last year, July 6th, uh, in uh, the Journal of American Medical Association uh, and followed by an article in Harvard School of Public Health press release uh, talking about patients at small isolated rural hospitals in America are more likely to receive lower quality of care. There was an NPR uh, uh, article or story told that when critical uh, – talking about critical access hospital, hospitals not being so critical. These kinds of things predict the demise and the death of small and rural hospitals, although we think it's important to realize that 25% of Americans live in small and rural hospital areas. 70 million Americans are, are served and get their primary care from small and rural hospitals every year. So our reaction was a bit like uh, the reaction of this character Gimli that we're looking at on the slide from The Lord of the Rings. For those of you who have seen the movie, you may recall in the, the last of the trilogy, uh, going before the last great battle, and this is a David and Goliath story. This is one of good versus evil, and uh, the evil was represented by a ring that had to be destroyed in a particular place, and there was this young ring bearer that was protected by a small band of warriors, and the head of the band of warriors, Aragorn, calls together uh, this band and says to them that, in order to, to protect the ring bearer, in order to protect what's important, we're going to have to all stand together. But surely in this battle, we're going against a, a large enemy with many obstacles and 10,000, uh, an enemy that's 10,000 strong, and surely we will die. And this character that we're looking at, uh, listening to this, said, certainty of death, small chance of success, what are we waiting for? So we took this as our mantra that we were not going to focus on uh, on our own death, but rather what could we do to really make an impact and make a difference? And how could we approach this, and how could we approach the partnership for patients uh, in a way that would allow us to be able to, uh, to make a difference and make an impact? So on reducing preventable harm, we became the first rural hospital in the U.S. to adopt the NQF safe practices. And we're excited about taking a leadership role in that. And uh, we are uh, preparing for uh, getting our board certified and, and being among the first hospitals to do that. We're a national leader in implementing the five rights of imaging. I spoke with Dr. Denham earlier and told him that we'd been published uh, locally and regionally uh, about a partnership that that our hospital is partnering with another local rural hospital in order to reduce the number of images that we've had. And we've been very successful in reducing uh, uh, the uh, – in looking at the overutilization of particularly CT scans. Uh, we also – our CEO, Mike Williams, is the founder of Texas Cares, and uh, which is uh, – with the help of TMIT has become a national program with America Cares, and we've cut our hospital readmission rate not by 20 percent, but by 67 percent, and our readmission rate is so low that now if we have one readmission, we get pretty upset about that. So that's where we are now, uh, but this is a small chance of success because it doesn't come without its price. 
in reducing hospital admissions and in reducing the number of images that we conduct, we have actually lost several million dollars in revenue. Now, for a lot of you, the, that several million dollars of revenue would be a rounding error, but for those of us in small and rural hospitals, that uh, that accounts for a large portion of our NOI, and in fact, uh, accounted for nearly half of our NOI lost uh, by reduce by having the system improvements that that we have. We're all in, but we need help, and so our challenge is: we, we're here, we're ready to act. What are we waiting for? Uh, we will continue to to act as quickly as uh, as possible. We feel that uh, small hospitals may be the fastest to act. It's not enough. We all have to report our quality data so that we can dispel these myths and rumors that are coming in these articles uh, because we believe that we can uh, provide high quality care and uh, and take great care of our patients. So, uh, Chuck, thank you for letting me participate today. Thank you very much. So I think uh, Bill and uh, Andy, you're hearing that our rural hospitals are absolutely um, wanting to compete. And we found this with the LeapFrog Group, as I am the co-chair of the LeapFrog Group Safe Practices Program. And we were we kind of led the campaign for adoption of the survey with LeapFrog. And we were shocked by the fact that the rural hospitals, we were going to grant an exemption. And they were like, Steve, they said, no, we want to compete and we want to be in the game. And we find the same with the safe practices. So I think taking back the message that we need some unique perspective, which I think today we're hearing at the uh, at the meeting of the uh, Partnership for Patients, that there will be an affinity group across all 26, likely, at least 18 now, but probably all 26 of the Ends with a dimension of rural, and I know we have a lot of rural listeners on the webinar, so more to follow. We think that the leadership's really listening to us about that, but uh, Bill and Andy, we may have some rural issues regarding measurement that'll be key. I'd like to go back to, to uh, Mike Henderson and have him succinctly just readdress his three questions and have uh, Andy and Bill react to them uh, as, uh, uh, as a first step in our uh, Q&A right now. Uh, uh, Mike, do you want to just recast your three questions? Yeah, thanks, Chuck. I guess the number one question, as it almost is, always is, is communication. And uh, just a high-level view of the next steps in the communication strategy for those uh, on the line, I think it would be helpful, Andy and Bill. Yeah, um, so uh, I'll, well, I guess we'll address these as, as you ask them. But, you know, on the communications, when you raise, this, this is Andy Hackbarth, when you when you asked about that originally, the first thing that came to mind was the national content developer, um, which is a contractor that's been um, brought in to manage the content dissemination. And I think, um, and we'll be creating a website um, with what I think is a lot of the resources that you're talking about. Um, it will cover things like traditional content, clinical content, intervention tools, um, measures, uh, stories from the field and so forth, um, but it will also focus or we'll, we'll have information on um, ways that uh, hospitals can tell their story, uh, communication strategy, and, and, and so forth. Uh, it will also be a hub for information about the initiative. So I think um, that resource, which is not live yet as I understand it, will um, be a hub for that type of information and for um, uh, communication from the, the the federal side, I, I'll also say that you know this this local strategy um, is relevant for the communication work as well. So um, there'll be you know a lot of the the questions and answers related to the day to day work of the partnership for patients will be most appropriately asked to the the HEN um, for, for hospital to the HEN. So that that's another another thing to recognize. So really, I think it's the combination of this national content developer and, and the web resource that it's developing, um, which will include, uh, you know, calendar of events, uh, communications tools, forums, and so forth, and uh, communication uh, with with their local HENs. I think that's great because I uh, think yeah, yeah. A, a one stop shop for the content and what's really happening. That. And that's, I know that's tough to do, but I think that'll be a great opportunity for all the hospitals to tune into that. Yeah. Um, if I go on, my second question is really about the total number of hospitals you think are going to be enrolled in HENs. Is it 20%? Is it 50%? I know we've all been signing up, and I don't know if, you, if uh, CMS or uh, 
the central group for partnership have got a sort of total tally yet of the percentage are going to function through hands or how much are just going to be out there contributing to the national good? Sure, yeah, and that's, I mean, that's a really good question that we, we probably should have sort of described more up front. You know, the, the, the vision here is that all or, or just about all the hospitals participating will be working within, within the hospital engagement network. Um, I don't have the exact count of hospitals that have, that have joined. It, it, I, I believe it's somewhere between 3,000 and 4,000 at this point, um, and I think our target is, is upwards of, of 4,000. So we're talking about roughly 80% of the hospitals in the country, um, and the, the vision is for um, as, as many of those as possible, and at this point it looks like just about all of them will be participating within a hospital engagement network. That's really the vehicle through which we see uh, this initiative working and, and sort of the, the resources that are critical to the hospital success. Um, are, are going to be coming from those AGNs. You know, I think that is important because I think, as I said earlier, I think the hands have the challenge. Uh, how do they really engage and uh, muster support in the hospitals to drive these programs? Yeah. So I think that will be a very interesting part. And, and actually, j just before you move on, I, I, you also asked when you originally stated it, um, how many hospitals will be included in the national measurement. Um, and, oh, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry, thanks. Yeah, um, and, and it's it might be interesting to note, uh, since this is a measurement, um, we've gone through a bunch of measurement issues, that the, the national measure is going to be uh, not only looking at hospitals who are participating, even though we expect um, at this point to have many, many hospitals in the country and the, the majority of hospitals in the country um, participating. The, as Bill described, the national measure is built on existing data sets um, based on um, for the for the adverse events on a, a mixture of the MPSMS system, which is based on uh, Medicare uh, fee for service hospitals uh, uh, data submissions, mm -hmm. and then the HCUP data set, which is a, a, a series of state da state databases. Um, so we're at, at the national measure level. We're really looking at the entire country, um, not just looking at um, hospitals um, who who have. Uh, signal their participation or who are actively participating. And, and uh, the sort of important technical note there is that that na national measure is not intended to be uh, a measure of the impact attributable to the initiative. It's really a national snapshot uh, over time, um, where is the country and has, has the country gotten to, to the goal that we set. You know, I think that's really important uh, from where I stand because just putting the data out there is going to get people's attention and help drive the program. That's right. So I think getting that out, and um, I wasn't totally clear when that first the baseline data will appear, and Bill may be able to say that, because uh, I think that is going to be one of the impetuses to say, hey, we've got to move on this, guys. Yeah, the, this is Bill Munier. The, the baseline data... Uh, which will be finalized. We just have some of it still trickling in. It'll be finalized in May of this year. It will be for the year 2010. Mm -hmm. And by the way, since I'm talking again, I'd just like to correct. Uh, apparently, I said that we had one end, uh, 137 adverse events per 100,000. I wish that were the case. It's actually, <laughs> it's actually 137 adverse events per 1,000, so that was a slip of the tongue, which I'd like to correct for the record on this call. Yeah, I appreciate that. My, my thank, you, thank you, Bill. That uh, uh, we'll uh, put that in the transcript, and that's what a wonderful thing about having a transcript is that we can kind of correct it up. Front, so we'll make sure to do that for you. Uh, Mike, did you have another question? Yeah, my final Before question, I, uh, I guess, Andy, was around the ability and the. So it, I don't know. There's a national plan through your oversight groups for coordinating some of the hand data, aggregating that in a more timely manner. Because I kind of see that as this interim step between truly local and then the national and that was the gist of what I was trying to get at there sure yeah and so the you know what you described as this intermediate level data um, will be collected by well so you know the local measures will be uh, collected and used by hospitals primarily to support their improvement efforts, but they'll also be submitted to the HEN. The HEN will then, uh, I believe on a monthly basis, compile a, a performance uh, report, which will include HEN-level aggregated measure data on 
not necessarily every measure that that's being collected by their constituent hospitals, but on a set of uh, sort of leading indicators that describe the progress. So maybe a, a really critical outcome measure for each intervention um, and readmission, something along those lines. That report, which will also include sort of a narrative description of what seems to be working, what sort of resources are being available, feedback from, from hospitals and so forth, will be uh, submitted back up to the, the federal coordinating group. Um, and based on, you know, what that the, at the federal level we're seeing across the country um, at, from HEN to HEN, um, the, the strategic leaders of the initiative at the federal level will be making decisions about um, where to focus communications efforts, educational efforts, resources, um, you know, the attention of the national content developer, which is, which is going to be supporting all the HENs uh, across the country and, and other sort of strategic decisions like that. Uh, and then, you know, likewise, the, the HENs will be using um, the data they receive through, through that uh, mechanism to make similar decisions within their own constituency. Allocation of uh, support resources, uh, s success stories that they wanna, they wanna um, sort of announce uh, nationally, uh, draw attention to their great work and so forth. Um, the Partnership for Patients provides a vehicle to do that through the national content developer and through um, just its, its, its national structure and the prominence of the initiative. So all of those activities will be supported through this um, chain of, of measured measurement and data submission, which starts locally with the hospitals doing this measurement for their um, improvement project, but also sort of funnels up uh, and aggregates up uh, to the HENs and then to the to the national level. Is that does that answer the, the question that you had? Yeah, no, I think that's good. Cause it, I, I think coming back to what Alan was saying is, what data we are we really going to put in front of our boards on a quarterly basis? And I think it's hospitals need to understand these different layers of data because they, they do convey different messages and decisions will need to be made of how am I going to use this to inform and communicate. And I think you are covering it well. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, and actually just to, to, to Ellen's point, I mean, she mentioned that this, um, and, and this does sound like a lot of different moving pieces as Bill and I go through this, but the hope is for hospitals and for their boards, um, it actually looks pretty straightforward and rational. And, and you know, the, 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 you know the, the way it should look to them is a few, a, a few, ser a few steps that will sort of result in, in hopefully, uh, you know, accelerated quality improvement in, in these areas. You know, step one is they join a hospital engagement network and they, they sort of establish a communication with, with that organization. And in a lot of cases, that relationship already exists. Um, the, the, the second step is the, the hen with feedback from the hospitals describe an improvement agenda covering at a minimum those core adverse event areas and care transitions. Um, the, the HEN will be supporting specific interventions and from HEN to HEN there'll be certain latitude for customization of that at the hospital level. But essentially there's an improvement agenda that's gonna be um, focusing at a minimum on the uh, improvement agenda of, of the partnership for patients um, and that will be supported by the HEN. And then step three is um, along with that improvement agenda there'll be a set of measures that are supported by the HEN that hospitals within that HEN will be asked to, to, to track and, and submit on a, on a periodic basis as defined by the HEN. And so, so to the boards who, um, as Ellen and uh, Steve, uh, um, I'm sorry, as Ellen has described, um, who are essential to, to this work um, and, and, and getting the sort of improvements, the sort of unprecedented improvements that, that we're, we're targeting for this campaign, um, they should probably be looking to those local measures as a starter set for a dashboard that they can use to um, to track and uh, support the improvement activities within their within their hospital, and that's that's probably no different than what they've done if they're already um, engaged in this type of work um, uh, before. So so hopefully it will not seem um, too different. It'll seem like a just additional resources supporting a uh, a process um, that 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 has existed, but will just uh, be accelerated through this through this program. Andy, Chuck here, uh, I, and I, I think um, I want to address the fact that uh, Mike, who's so articulate in, in these questions and really practical, uh, and you and Bill and a number of us will be writing an implementation article that will complement 
an article that really sets forth the measures in a very clear way, and we already have that article done. And I think your staged approach, Andy, of taking a reader case, uh, meaning somebody who reads that article, could be an Ellen or uh, others that could say, okay, as I read through this, it is, it is more straightforward, and we're showing a wiring diagram, but really here's how we can uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 carry that forth. And those articles will be published uh, uh, in the second quarter of this year. Uh, I have another question that came in uh, from our audience, and the question is, how will you formally, and you may not have the answer today, but I, it, one, it, it is one I think uh, Dennis Wagner and Paul McGann will likely come back with, but how, how can um, there be, will there be a formal or just informal way for patients and families and communities to directly work with HENS and be involved with their local hospitals in the partnership? Is there a mechanism yet for patients and families to, to be uh, actively involved and provide input? Yeah, that's, and that's a great question. Um, there is absolutely a formal mechanism in, in the, the program um, to engage patients and families and also other stakeholders, um, uh, you know, other than providers who obviously have an interest in this work, payers, purchasers, and so forth. Um, so th there will be a national contractor whose, whose sole job it is to harness um, the the energy and the motivation and the insight from those other constituent groups and, and really focusing on, on patients and families to um, both to um, really motivate hospitals uh, but also to provide uh, insight. Uh, the the name of that contractor has changed so many times. I'm sort of embarrassed. I don't I don't know what the latest iteration of it is, but it will exist. It, you know, at one point it was the patient and families contractor, patient and family engagement contractor might be the the the, uh, the current incarnation. But that mechanism will definitely exist. Um, part of its job will be to create connections between um, you know, local connections between patients and families and other groups, advocacy groups like that. Um, and the HENs and hospitals and their constituencies. Um, so it, it's you know it's a it's a national contractor, but understanding that a lot of this uh, these interactions are most powerful at the local level. There's going to be that um, that support as well. Great. And one of the questions uh, has been asked, and I ask it actually, of Helen Burston at the National Quality Forum, and that was, when will the uh, 2013 Safe Practices for Better Healthcare uh, be started, and how will those be crosswalked to the partnership? And so I will assure that they will be crosswalked. We don't have the exact uh, date of submission for new practices or updates, but we are writing a uh, leader's guide for the boardroom of, that will address the, the, the gaps and the overlaps between HACs, between the, pa the Partnership for Patients, uh, and between the Safe Practices and Serious Reportable Events. Uh, also, uh, until that website is up, Mike, uh, that has all the latest information, we're going to put on our landing page at safetyleaders.org uh, 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 what's new. And Andy and Bill, if there is, are things that, that are new, I, I'm sure that you'll help us uh, make sure we know them. And then we can link that out directly to that page so those that are following our webinars will be able to have uh, access. Um, the next question was regarding the cat the the uh, data capture year, the catchment period starting, will it be calendar 2010, will it be um, fiscal 2010, and what month? Yeah. Well, so, I, you know, this, this is Andy. I'll, I'll, I'll first say that there are sort of two versions of that question. One is maybe for the national measurement, and I'll, and I'll defer to Bill on that, and the other is for the local HEN level measures. So, so if, you know, if the question is about the, the national measure, I believe we're doing a uh, calendar year uh, uh, breakdown starting with a baseline of 2010. Is that right, Bill? Uh, this is Noel Eldridge for oh. Bill. He had to step out at 220. But yes, the, the, the years we refer to are, uh, are calendar years. Great. Okay. So, so for the national measures, we'll be, um, you know, using 2010 calendar year as the baseline and then um, producing updates, um, you know, eventually um, for each calendar year subsequent up through 2013. For the for the local measures, it's really sort of defined uh, by the the HEN. But I would I would guess that there isn't going to be a uh, a year uh, periodicity on those measures, um, as uh, as Dr. Henderson described earlier in um, 
in, in, uh, in exactly the right way, the, the, the usefulness of these local measures is in their timeliness. And so these short cycle measures are really what drives improvement. So, um, at, you know, at the local measure level, uh, it's, it's really up to the HENs what they define as a baseline um, and the, the periodicity of the data, but we expect that it's going to be uh, much shorter cycles than, than annual data, maybe even, you know, down to the level of, of you know, new, new observations every week and, and looking at the change in, uh, in, in processes uh, at, at that level, but, but maybe, you know, more, uh, for some for others, uh, quarterly uh, or monthly or quarterly at, at the, at the uh, broadest. Great. Next question comes from our QIO community and from those working with QIOs. Uh, can you describe the cross linkages and how the QIOs play a complementary role to the uh, uh, partnership? Yeah, and this is a question that uh, that I know I know we get a lot. Um, so the, the the partnership for patients is very much a, a meant to be a complement of of the QIO work. Um, so we'll be relying on the, the QIOs and, and their existing resources to, to support this, and the QIOs are hopefully um, going to rely on the, the partnership for patients in, in the same way as we tackle some of the same same problems. Um, at, at you know, I, I think the how that manifests itself will be different um, from state to state or region to region. But uh, you know, we're, we're certainly closely coordinated with um, you know within CMS with uh, with the, the QIO function um, and uh, and are doing our best to rationalize the the work of the partnership with with the QIOs. We know that uh, at TMIT because we serve both uh, as strongly as we possibly can that the speaker link. Um, program that Frank described earlier directly hits one of the contract requirements for the QIOs, which is to get patients and families into the uh, quality improvement infrastructure, and there'll be uh, more articles that will be coming out in these special issues addressing um, the, 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 the role that patients can play uh, on uh, committees and uh, patient advisory committees, along with Dr. Tamimi from the Mayo Clinic and Sue Sheridan, who many know to be a real champion and patient act, uh, advocate as well, with a number of other folks. Um, the, the other uh, piece is the board certification and training and leadership uh, is also uh, addresses a need of the uh, QIOs in their contracting and also cross links with our initiative and our promise to the partnership as a contributor uh, to uh, through our Greenlight program, uh, of which uh, Dr. Henderson is a, uh, is a, one of the, one of our leaders from the Food Clinic. I'd like to go to Dr. Uh, to, to Arjun uh, Srinivasan. Uh, is he still on? And if he is, does he have any comments or questions? Uh, hey, Chuck, it's Arjun. Uh, no, I don't. I, I, I think we'll get you know more into some of the uh, use of uh, NHSN for some of the local measure issues uh, on the next call. Uh, but in, in the meantime, if anyone has any questions about the healthcare associated infections or about NHSN, uh, they should please feel free to contact, uh, contact me at any time. Great. Thank you very much. We're going to finish on time, and so what I'd like to do now is just go to the final slide set. Uh, it starts with Texas Cares at um, safetyleaders.org. This is a, uh, a national uh, approach that is being undertaken, and Texas Cares or American Cares addresses the, uh, uh, the coalition uh, um, uh, that we have uh, assembled for rural hospitals, and, uh, and it's a, a collaborative alliance for rural excellence and we'll be uh, partnering with and trying to really serve those rural hospitals like the likes of what Steve uh, Sosa runs. The next slide is the Greenlight program, and you will see impact calculators uh, that we'll be providing to the, the partnership to help uh, get the green light in the boardroom for people like Ellen and others who are board members to really feel comfortable about allocating resources and see the translation of quality improvement directly to financial return. And then finally, uh, the slide, uh, the, the next slide that says surfing the healthcare tsunami, bring your best forward. This is the, the title of our next discovery movie. The movie will showcase the partnership for patients, and it will also uh, have uh, uh, Dr. Howard Coe and uh, Carolyn Clancy and a number of leaders uh, uh, from uh, our agencies in our frontline hospitals as the Chasing Zero uh, our, uh, uh the Discovery Channel movie did, and so, that, but it, that is the title of February's webinar, and we are bringing a number of trustees 
and C-suite leaders together to address what the guide for 2012 could be. And I'd like to have whoever's uh, not muted, if they could mute uh, right now. And uh, but uh, and this will be February uh, 16th at one uh, one o'clock. Uh, and the final uh, slide is is that we will drill down on the five rights of imaging program. We are using that as a teaching moment for board uh, boards of directors to understand this uh, initiative that's focused on reducing ionizing radiation, overuse, underuse, and misuse of uh, imaging. And we'll also have a companion program that will follow in laboratory, which is addressing the five rights, which are the right study, the right order, the right way, the right report, and the right action. And we'll be building impact calculators to demonstrate uh, the value uh, of undertaking these. And these are uh, the, the overuse, underuse, and misuse of imaging uh, dramatically does contribute to transitions in care and has a crosslink to the other uh, safe practices. The next slide actually addresses all of the collaborators that we're involved with in this five rights program, including the World Health Organization. And then finally, the, the last uh, slide is the article on the partnership for patients. For those that are, are coming on the webinar for the first time, we wrote an article that described the partnership at its origins, and it, it may be downloaded from safety leaders. I'd like to close by turning it over to Alicia Cole. Uh, Alicia, would you close us? And again, it's, this is not a tokenism uh, 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 strategy. We really do value our patients and family advocates who are on this webinar today. And Alicia, would you uh, ground us in our close? And then if the speakers could just stay on a minute after we uh, turn off the main uh, webinar, we'll allow her to have the last words and then we'll just do a quick debrief. Alicia? Yes, thank you, Dr. Denham. I, I really appreciate being involved in this webinar today. I think it's a been a great collaborative effort, and I really got some good information. And what I'd like to leave everyone with, we talked a lot about the hospital engagement networks, the HENS, and as part of their mandate, they are required to conduct intensive training programs to teach and support hospitals in making care safer. Um, they'll be sort of the mobile class for hospitals in achieving these goals at the local levels that we talked about. And I just want to reinforce that this is a great opportunity to engage patients, to engage advocates, you know, advocates um, in these uh, training sessions and in these board meetings and these, these mobile classrooms because, as uh, Dr. Denham says, you know, you don't want to waste a good crisis. Someone like me who went into the hospital, a healthy person, ended up with, you know, multiple hospital-acquired infections and was able to survive. I have real-life, real-world experience to bring to your boardrooms and your, your training sessions to put a face basically, to the metrics and the statistics. And I love what uh, Dr. Steve said, I believe, it was, um, who said at his hospital, they don't have a buy-in, they're all in. And I think using patient stories and our experience in collaboration with what hospitals are doing, with the QIOs, um, partnership for patients, uh, all the stakeholders can be present and interactive at the table and be a part of, of the solution and, and, in, and improving health care. So I thank you for the opportunity to be here today. It's been a blessing to me, and I, I appreciate all the hard work that you all are doing. Uh, Arjun, we look forward to you next month, as well as uh, l and And, Steve, uh, keep up the great work uh, in your Seabiscuit initiative and uh, fight the good fight. We'll uh, close the webinar, and if the speakers can stand, thank you very much. Thanks, sir.